standing around the room. We have, please come in and stand up front if you need to. There's a bench over here if anyone wants to sit down. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, this is session three of our 11th annual Capitol Hill Lecture Series, organized by the Fund for American Studies and the Office of Senator Rand Paul. We've been thrilled with the attendance this summer, and obviously today is no exception. Let me just ask with a show of hands, how many of you attended the previous lectures by Matt Taibbi and John Tamney? Well, not, not everyone. We've got a new crowd here. That's great. Some of you have. How many of you are attending a program of the Fund for American Studies this summer? Wonderful, wonderful. Great to see a lot of you here. Well, this program and, and the free lunches we provide you afterwards are sponsored by the Einhorn Family Foundation from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Today we're blessed to have Nancy and Steve Einhorn here. So let's show them our gratitude for their generosity. Lunch vouchers to the Dirksen Center Cafeteria will be available to all the attendees when the lecture concludes. Uh, this summer, we've scheduled five lectures centered on the theme of courageous leaders challenging the status quo. Uh, each of the speakers is in the thick of national conversation on many important issues such as pandemic lockdowns, social media, censorship, and other topics. And each speaker has taken the establishment on and courageously challenge the status quo to uncover the truth behind complex issues. Today we'll hear from Senator Rand Paul. Next week, former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard will be here. Both have challenged the conventional wisdom in Washington and in their own political parties. Uh, next week will be uh, on July 19th at 11.45 in this very room. It'll be a little earlier. Registration will open as soon as this lecture concludes today. So be sure to get registered. Well, now it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker. Before I do, I'm going to mention a book I recommend by Steve Einhorn, who's here. It's called Climate Change, What They Rarely Teach in uh, College. Uh, you can get it at climatechangeus.com. And that promotion, he didn't ask me to do that. Uh, but I rec highly recommend it. I had uh, Steve Einhorn on my Liberty and Leadership podcast yesterday talking about the book. It's excellent, full of information, historical and empirical data, but very readable. Well, our speaker today has a book as well, The Case Against Socialism, which R Senator Rand Paul wrote with his wife, Kelly. He tells me he's got another book coming out this fall. More on that at another time. Uh, as you all know, he's, the, he's a senator uh, from Kentucky the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, he has, uh, was elected after a while working as an ophthalmologist there uh, and uh, gave up his practice for all intents and purposes to represent the citizens of Kentucky as a fighter for limited government and our Constitution here in Washington. Uh, I'm not going to go into his committee assignments, but every day he's on the front lines fighting for individual liberty, transparency in government, the First Amendment, and adherence to the Constitution. So without further ado, please welcome Senator Rand Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what a great crowd. I think in thanking the Einhorns, one thing that's important to know and to be proud of in our country is that people who are successful give back to the community. Right, left, center, you name it. There are very, very wealthy people in the country who have given back. Uh, one family or one gentleman gave $100 million to fix the Washington Monument when we had an earthquake. The function of capitalism and the rich wealth that capitalism creates often goes back to allow us to do things we wouldn't be allowed to do or wouldn't have a chance to do. Poor countries don't have a chance to look at the environment or to consider the the problems of pollution, rich countries do. We do it out of our success and our wealth. If you don't have that, you're not able to do it. I thought we'd start out the beginning with a poll of the audience. So we'll have audience participation. How many people in the audience consider themselves to be a conservative? All right, that's a fair split. How many would consider yourselves to be progressive? Okay, decent amount. Uh, how many think that you are a libertarian? All right, pretty good mix. How many people would ca call themselves a socialist? 
All right, there are a few. And the thing is, is that I think that labels sometimes aren't particularly accurate, and it's important sometimes to look at the issues, because sometimes you think you're one thing and maybe you're another. For example, I think that the label that fits me best is I call myself a classical liberal. I'm not a reactionary, I'm not really conservative on some issues, I'm actually very progressive on some issues. But I'm conservative on some other issues, so what is the best description of things? So one of the things that I think is important to start with if we want to know where we're coming from is what kind of government do we want or what kind of government do we think we have? How many people in the audience would describe the government we have as a democracy? How many would describe it as a republic? Probably more. And the true answer may be somewhere in between. Some people call it our, as a representative democracy. But the key distinction is not the majority of vote necessarily, but what we vote on, what I vote on, or what the majority in Congress passes laws has limitations. We can't just do anything we want. We can't pass a law to do anything we want. We're restrained. The majority is restrained. This is something that our founding fathers thought was pretty important. So for example, the famous case of Ben Franklin comes out of the Constitutional Convention and a woman shouts at him, will it be a monarchy, will it be a democracy or a republic? And he says a republic, if you can keep it. Now some people think, oh, it's just semantics, who cares whether we're a democracy or a republic, that's just not a big deal. But you hear this repeated often, and many uh, that report the news say, we want to make the world safe for democracy. That was a Woodrow Wilson thing, or we need to fight around the world to preserve and protect and create democracy. But if our founding fathers were here, they would be somewhat horrified by that, because they feared majority rule as much as they feared a monarchy. They thought that a majority, that 51% of the people could do bad things also. And so they wanted that even when 51% of the people wanted something, there to be certain rules or standards you looked up against that and said, you can't do that. I'll give you a, histor a historical example of this. A majority of the voters in the South voted for Jim Crow laws. Now in a constitutional republic, as I see it, those laws should have been struck down, but they weren't in many cases. In, our, in my state, for example, we had a college, Berea College, that was integrated in the 1850s. It was integrated all the way up to 1905. And this is a sad part of our history. We actually did pretty well after the war. We were doing better after the war. And then we had sort of a going backwards around the turn of the century. And the Supreme Court went along with a lot of this, which is another example of why the Supreme Court's not always right. Supreme Court in 1898 uh, rules, you know, that separate but equal is going to be the doctrine. Some of the most famous people in our country and some of the most, I think, respectable people in our country are the people who actually dissented. They were vocal in their dissent, and they were in a, in a very small minority, and that would be Justice Harlan, who said in the case, Plessy versus Ferguson, that separate but equal was not right, that, uh, ci that uh, civil liberties and civil rights should be colorblind. He was ahead of his time. Plessy versus Ferguson stays in, 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 in power as law all the way till Brown. But when we look at this, the labels are sometimes deceiving. So what is conservative? What is liberal? There's a famous case about this period of time called Lochner. And in Lochner, they decide that uh, the government can't regulate the right of contracts, that you have a right of contract. But they decide this through something called substantive due process. And you think, well, conservatives hate substantive due process and liberals like it. Why? That's the standard, because people say, well, that's how abortion was justified in Roe was over substantive due process. And conservatives say, that's an invention of rights, we're not supposed to do that. But if you go all the way back to the very beginning, back to the days of republic versus democracy versus getting the Constitution, one of the biggest debates about the Constitution was, should we list or enumerate your rights? And there was a whole group of people who said, let's don't write them down, because if we write them down, people will think that's all you have and then we'll develop this precedent of just defending the rights that are listed and not those that are not listed. Now as the debate went on, Madison in, in, in uh, Federalist 45 writes that the powers of the government are few and limited. Now that should be pretty easy to understand that we're going to have a constitution and the federal government can only do this, so if we didn't tell them they couldn't do this, your rights 
should be protected. The government's not allowed to do something that invades or uh, encroaches upon that right if it's not listed. So some said that's enough. We're just going to define government as having few and limited powers. But I think the converse of that, and this is more the libertarian position than the conservative position, is that our rights are many and ill-defined. The powers of the government are few and limited and defined in the Constitution. That's all they're supposed to do. But then the reverse of that is that your rights are many and ill-defined. What does that mean? It means that you have unenumerated rights. It means that maybe you do have a right to privacy. And conservatives sometimes are aghast. They're like, well, what? no, no one has a right to privacy. It wasn't written into the Constitution. Well, the Constitution actually did write in this, but they wrote it in a more vague way. As they were writing the Bill of Rights and as they listed important rights, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, as they were listing these rights, they said, well, what will happen if people think that this is all the rights? So they put in the Ninth Amendment. And the Ninth Amendment says those rights not listed are not to be denied or disparaged. Reminds me of one time I met uh, Justice Scalia. And I was at a cocktail party, and I made the mistake of going over there and talking, trying to talk to him about the Ninth Amendment. He wasn't too excited to talk to me about it. I guess something about the Supreme Court thinking that lawyers are somehow smarter than doctors. But uh, <laughs> we had a short discussion about it. But he was sort of more from the conservative school. Robert Bork was from this conservative school. And the school was that there are no, there may be unenumerated rights, but we're not protecting them. We're going to protect what's written into the Constitution. And that's sort of what's kind of developed over time. And then we developed sort of a hierarchy of rights. The First Amendment was more important than other rights. And then some rights gradually over time, like the right to contract, fell away. In Lochner, they said that the state governments couldn't make rules getting in between contracts of bakers and their employees. But over time, we've, we've reversed that. But the idea that there are unenumerated rights is still a debate. It was a debate for our founding fathers. Did we list them all in the Bill of Rights? Is the Ninth Amendment important to say that there are other rights? Because as this debate moves forward, you get closer to the Roe decision. Before that, you have the Griswold decision. And in the Griswold decision, it was a debate over whether a Connecticut law banning birth control would be constitutional or not. And the court ruled, using substantive due process, or an interpretation of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment, that said that there are rights that you possess, even if they're not explicitly stated, they ruled that basically you do have a right to choose. You have a right to privacy. You have a right to uh, make a decision on birth control. And people say, well, if you like Griswold, what do you think about abortion? I was like, do I really want to talk about abortion in front of all these people? But here to me is, is I don't think abortion issue is about substantive due process. I don't think it's about a right to privacy. I don't think it's about unenumerated rights. I think it's a, a very simple debate to describe, but a more difficult debate to get everybody in agreement on. I believe that the debate is simply about when life begins. Now, it's a, a hard question for many, but that's the question. There's not one of us here, no matter whether we're progressive, liberal, conservative, libertarian, who believes that if someone in, endangers your life or physically attacks you, that the government doesn't have a role in that. The question is just when life begins. I would say almost everybody here, probably everybody here, believes that after birth, if someone tries to hurt a baby, that they can be punished. They can go to jail for it. The question is just when life begins. And it's a difficult question, and people have to make the decision. But I don't think it has anything to do with, do with due process. So I come down on the, the point of view that we do have unenumerated rights, that you do have a right to privacy, and that that's inherent in the Ninth Amendment. It's inherent in the discussion, the debate. The debate still that our founding fathers had over whether we should enumerate all the rights or whether they were implied is still an important debate. But a big part of this debate is whether or not there is a restraining force of the Constitution. When Jefferson talked about it, he said, let there no, be no more questions of confidence in man. He said, let the, the chains of the Constitution bind man from his mischief. Implied in all of that is that men, as a general category, men and women, have a natural proclivity, a natural inclination to rule over other people. Given power, people will continue to increase the power. So there has to be limitations on your power over another individual. So for some of us, we say government should do very little because 
So many things that we want to do are involved in opinion. Your opinion is different than mine. Leave each to his own. Unless maybe you're committing violence against another person, then we can all agree the government should involve itself. But for some of us, it's a belief in a very minimal government because we have to, or should, in a free society, agree to disagree over so many things. And that there are really the few things that government do, does should be the things that can't be done privately. If we did, I think we'd have a much different conception of government. We'd have a government that wasn't very involved. When our founding fathers started the government and started our country, it was actually more prestigious to be either the governor or to be in the state legislature than the federal Congress. They came up here periodically, and they dealt with a few things that basically we couldn't deal with otherwise. For some people who value their, their right to be left alone, they value their right and their freedom to make their own choices in their own life, the bigger the government gets, the less choices you have. Thomas Paine recognized this when he wrote that government is a necessary evil. And this is an important distinction. Some of you might say, well, government's not evil, and I'm not evil. I know I'm not evil, so we can't all be evil, right? But the conception of giving someone power over you to make decisions about your life is evil. And man or woman left to their own devices will want to have more power over their fellow man. So that's the whole idea of constraint. It's the idea of limited government. But we also have competing theories now. Some people believe in what's called a living constitution. And the living constitution is that, well, it kind of constrains a little bit, but pretty much what the majority wants, the majority gets. But I think that's a recipe for a time when the majority decides that they will have to have more and more authority over other individuals. So when I look at the arguments for why I want a limited government, why I want to be left alone, I think you could make these same arguments if you're a progressive. Why do you want to be left alone? Now, we still end up with this sticking point. You know, we have conservatives, and many of us think there is life in, in a baby before birth. And that'll be a sticking point. But the same sort of feeling that those on the left have, many on the right have. It's a feeling of wanting to be left alone. But then there are some ironies that come about. People say, hands off my body, I have my choice. And then they say, except for vaccines. By God, you take a vaccine and you're going to jail. Really, where's, where's, where's the consistency of that? Hands off my body, but oh yeah, you're fine to force a vaccine on me. It also gets to the problem of speech. I'm looking, right now actively looking for a good progressive in the Senate to co-sponsor a bill I have. I have a bill that says the government cannot bully, imply, or do anything to limit protected speech. But many on the left are now saying, oh, unless it's wrong, what if you're wrong? What if you're spreading misinformation about vaccines? Do you know what protected speech is? It's about opinions. I have the right to be wrong. You have the right to be wrong. Scientific disputation is always about presenting your arguments. And if any of you are scientists who have ever been to a scientific meeting, you get attacked at scientific meetings. They attack your premise. They attack your methods. Then someone does a study to disprove you. It was Einstein who said, I can never tell you with a surety that what I'm saying is the ultimate fact. I can tell you until someone disproves it. That's what science is about, people trying to disprove it. There are arguments on both sides of every one of the issues over the pandemic. There are arguments on both sides about whether masks work. We can go through them all if you want. There are arguments on both sides how much vaccines work. I finally came to the conclusion that those at risk should be vaccinated, should be their choice. But that, the, that we shouldn't try to tell people who are not at risk that they need to be vaccinated. So I would ask repeatedly, I would ask Dr. Fauci repeatedly, what is the evidence for telling many of you in the audience, particularly young males, that you need to have three vaccines? I said, is there any evidence that the young men in this audience will be less likely to die, go to the hospital, or become infected? Those seem to be the three key things you'd want, at least one of those, less infection, less transmission, less hospitalization, or death. There is no evidence that three vaccines for any of the young men in the audience, and probably the young women as well, keeps you from transmission, hospitalization, or death. Why is it hard to prove that? Because you don't die from COVID. 18 and under, 25 and under, the death rate is about 1,000 times less than it is for older people. Young people didn't die from this disease. You say, oh, no, I watched on CNN and I saw this person was sick. 
almost every one of them, 99.9% .9 of them, they're sad, but they were sad cases of people who were very sick already. It was those who already had great illness that did die from COVID, but almost no young people did. But why is this a question? With each successive vaccine, particularly for males between the ages of 16 and 25, there is a risk of a heart inflammation. Now, am I gonna tell you everybody gets it? No, it's rare. But what is the chance of your death? Even rarer. You have to, to weigh the risk versus the benefits, but in a free society, I should be allowed to say that. In a free society, the FBI, the government, shouldn't go to Twitter and say, we'd like you to take his opinion down because it's disinformation. And you say, oh, well, they're just asking him to take it down. No, they were threatening Twitter and threatening Facebook with, if you don't do this, there may be antitrust action. If you don't do this, there may be a revocation of your Section 230 liability protection. There may be consequences. It may go to the top levels of the White House if you're not listening. That shouldn't happen in a free society. There was a time when progressives were the best defenders of the First Amendment. Progressives through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they were the defenders. Conservatives often weren't good. Conservatives were fine with a little bit of control of speech. Where are the progressives now on this? Do progressives not remember that the FBI was involved with maligning those in the civil rights movement? Do, the, do people on the left not remember that it was the FBI that was involved with going after war protesters in the 60s? The Church Commission, which may well have been in this room, I'm not sure. The Church Commission that went after the abuses of the intelligence agencies, the progressive left was great on these issues. My party was wrong. Where are the progressives now to say it's wrong for the FBI to get involved with speech? I think this is something we need to think through, but the only way we get through some of these issues is we have to kind of forget a little bit about whether we think we're conservative or Republican or Democrat and think through the issues as they are. Are there other issues that transcend the label on the issue of war? Because I'm a strict constitutionalist, I don't think you go to war without a vote. It says you should declare war. People say, ah, it's too hard, you gotta do it all the time. It's like, well, is it worth it? Is your life worth 20 minutes of our time, an hour or two of our time to debate whether we go to war? Right now we have a proclamation on the books, an authorization to use force, an AUMF from 9-11, right after 9-11. Uh, some of you may not have been born then. Most of the people here weren't here when it was voted. But you know what they interpret that use of force to mean? that if you're in the military now, you can be sent to Syria, and they say, when did we declare war on anybody in Syria? When did Congress vote on this? Why am I going to Syria? And they would say, oh, we voted on it on 9-11. What's well, a bunch of crap. 9-11, the AUMF was to go after those who attacked us on 9-11, or aided and abetted them. It's very, very specific. And then people say, well, what about ancillary forces? What about Al-Qaeda everywhere else? It doesn't say that. Associated forces that people came to interpret this was never voted on Congress and it wasn't given. But look at it from this perspective. Do we not have an obligation in Congress to vote when we go to war? How can we take a vote from before you were born and tell you to go to war based on a vote? But I've tried to repeal this. And I've had bipartisan support, just not very much. I tried to repeal recently on the Senate floor the 9-11 AUMF authorization for military force and I got nine votes, three of the Republicans and five Democrats. Those are the people I consider, and I won't name them all, but Bernie Sanders was one, to be some of the better progressives, people who are consistent with their values on this. But many other people said, we can't repeal that authorization for force because we might need to go to war again. Vote on it, have a debate. Are young people's lives not worth having a debate over whether we go to war? Well, what about the troops in Mali or Somalia or Syria or wherever we are? Vote on it. The thing is, is so many of these wars are confusing that I'm not sure which side. There's like 10 different clans in Somalia. Are we always supporting the best people? Are we sometimes supporting the wrong side of these wars? We need to have votes on it. But a constitutional position that ends up not being right or left, doesn't have to be progressive or conservative, and can bring people together if we leave sort of our party labels behind. So I think free speech could be something that brings us together. I think the war powers could be something that brings us together. I think medical freedom could be. I know the abortion issue is still a sticking point for a lot of people, but the idea that if you are in feeling that you need to make your own decisions and these are your decisions, 
Shouldn't they be the same for vaccines? And people say, oh, no, well, you're harming someone else by not being vaccinated. Well, you might be able to make that argument if you knew of a vaccine that was actually 100% successful. Going back to why they tell you that you need to be vaccinated three times to go to Yale or Harvard or some of these schools that have decided authoritarianism is the way to go, it's not based on less death, it's not based on less hospitalization, and it's not based on less transmission. You know what it's based on? That you make antibodies when you get vaccinated. That is proof of absolutely nothing. And I told Fauci this. I said, look, I can give you 100 vaccines. You'll make, you'll make antibodies every time. I can give you vaccines to this carpet. You'll make antibodies every time. Does that mean you need a vaccine to the carpet? No, the question is, and there's another important part of this question, one, are you going to die or go to the hospital, or is it a problem with helping with transmission? If it doesn't, making antibodies means nothing. But there are many questions involved with this that aren't even being asked. If you don't ask whether you've been infected. So if you went into your doctor and said, I've had COVID, or by now you might go to your doctor and say, I've had COVID three times, do I really need to get three vaccines? I'm 18 years old and I'm healthy. Shouldn't somebody do a study and release a study, what does naturally acquired immunity do? Because what is naturally acquired immunity? It's a vaccine. What are vaccines based on? Naturally acquired immunity. So all the studies that the CDC puts out, you say, well, we need to respect science and we need to respect the CDC. Well, they need to respect the truth. They need to have part of their study be an arm of who's already had it, and what does that mean? When they finally did this, they found out in a million-person study between Florida and California that if you've been previously infected, your chances of being hospitalized were 57 times less than somebody who hadn't been infected. The vaccine was 25 times less. So I'm not saying the vaccine didn't help. All I'm saying is, so did having the infection. So if you're a young person, your risk of death is almost zero, and you decide you don't want to be vaccinated, and you've already been infected, what are your chances? And I've, I asked Dr. Fauci, what are the chances that these young people will get infected and die or go to the hospital or get sick? They don't know the answer, because the answer is virtually zero. And you say, I don't believe any of what you're saying, and I believe Dr. Fauci. Go get vaccinated. The thing is, is what's different between my argument and their argument is, I'm not forcing you to do anything. I'm not forcing you to accept my opinion. I'm giving you my opinion, take it or leave it. But think of the other side. The people who believe in mandating these things are not asking me to accept their opinion or their argument or to dispute with me. They're just saying, do as you're told. One of the things they said, well, it's been a disaster and COVID was a real disaster and we could have done a lot better if everybody had gotten vaccinated. You know, even that statement is so full of misinformation. Fauci was interviewed in the New York Times, and that was, he said, oh yes, it's one of my laments that we just didn't vaccinate enough people. Do you know how many people were vaccinated? What percentage of the people were vaccinated over age 65? It's like 97% of the people. How many people under 25? Probably 20% which means absolutely nothing, you all got it anyway, so you're all part of the immune pool now. But people who were at risk got vaccinated. But when you tell people something that's not true, that you need to absolutely get your two-year-old vaccinated, and you say, oh, my two-year-old had COVID last week, you've got to get him vaccinated. There's nothing true about that. The statement is completely false and not substantiated by science. What do you do? You breed vaccine hesitancy in everyone when you're dishonest to them. If we would have simply said, who are the people at risk? And there are people at risk. Other than, other than older folks, it's overweight folks. If you are significantly overweight, even at a younger age, maybe even at your age, probably not, but if you're 35 and you're 50 or 80 pounds overweight, you probably should get vaccinated. Weight was a big, huge thing here. Instead, they came forward and they said, oh, it's based on race and this and that. It's not. It's not a racially oriented disease. It's based on age and body weight for the most part. Some immune compromising conditions. But the thing is, it's ultimately based on freedom, and we have to decide whether or not we want to leave the freedom to the individual. I think the argument for small government boils down to a couple of things. The liberty argument is what Thomas Paine put forward. Every power we give the government is power we take away from the individual. There's also a more practical economic argument, and this is the argument that Milton Friedman put forward. I call this more the economic or the efficiency argument. And it is the argument that no one spends somebody else's money as wisely as their own. Think about it in your own personal life. 
If I were to ask you for $1,000 today to invest in something, and you had to work, you know, four weeks to get $1,000, and you had to save this $1,000, took you a year to save $1,000, and it came from your hard-earned work, would you think about giving me the $1,000 for the business venture? Would you investigate the business venture? But then think about if you're a city councilman and I ask you for $20 million. It's not their money. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have a city council and we won't have government. It just means that the more decisions and the more money you give to government, they will never. It's inherent that government is less efficient than the marketplace. Why is the marketplace efficient? Why do I love capitalism? Because it's a democratic process, instantaneous, and if you don't obey the will of the democracy of buyers, you're punished. You're punished immediately, and it's ruthless. You say, oh, that's terrible. Ruthlessness of the marketplace breeds the efficiency. The reason you can go on and get stuff on Amazon and they're knocking on the door by the time you finish typing it in, because they, they're beating the competition. They're offering you something to try to beat out someone else. Competition is a miraculous thing, and it works in the marketplace. But we have to understand that that system also is the system that created entrepreneurs that are able to give back to the community. The biggest donor of land in our country and to the national park system, I think, was the Rockefeller family. From great wealth and prosperity comes many, many good things. And so rather than be a country or a culture that disparages people who are successful, I applaud them. I'm not jealous. Well, maybe sometimes jealous. Sometimes I wish I had a jet. But the thing is, is it's not helpful. It's a terrible emotion to covet other people's things and to think they're bad or somehow want to take it from them. I want more of them. I want more of you to be rich. I want us to be a great country, and we are. We have to appreciate it. We also have to appreciate how far we've come. So often you'll hear people just lambasting, saying, America's a terrible country and a terrible racist nation and terrible institutional racism. None of that's true. We are better off than we've ever been at any time in the history of the entire world. The whole world is better off, but we are the tip of that. We are the, the best example, the shiny example of freedom and meritocracy ever in all time of history. So are there still problems? Yes. Compare them to a decade ago. Compare them to Berea College being forced to have uh, you know, blacks and whites be separated in school. Compare them to the Jim Crow South. Where we are is a wonderful place. That means we can't get better. Let's quit maligning our own country. Let's appreciate what a great country it is and that any one of you, I promise you, I don't care what your religion is, the color of your skin, I don't care where you came from, the south or the north, although I prefer the south, but there are no limitations on you. You go out in the workforce, man, woman, white, black, brown, the limitations are not there. In fact, it's the opposite. People want you. People want diversity in a private way. People want people to succeed. There is not this huge world of haters out there. The haters are the anomaly when they exist. What exists now is a society that is moving in the right direction, and I think a society and a country that we should be proud of. Thank you. We've got some microphones. If you'll raise your hand, we'll take some questions. Right back here. Try to be uh, clear and loud, please. from Afghanistan and I'm a TFAS intern. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I have two questions for you. First, how do you believe the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan will impact global security, especially the countries neighboring Afghanistan? Okay. Yes, okay, let's stop with the one. And uh, it echoes in here and I don't hear very well. What? Okay, the way we did. Let's just start with one before we go to the next one. I'll, I'll sure. give you a second question. Sure. Is that the end of the first? 
Um, so how do you believe the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan will impact global security, uh, especially the countries neighboring Afghanistan, considering the Taliban's resurgence in their efforts to train more militants and relocate militant individuals from Pakistan to Afghanistan? And second, during the peace... Wait on the second. Can you repeat the first one for me? Okay. So, so it's a question about Afghanistan, leaving Afghanistan, resurgence of the Taliban, I guess should we have left, did we leave in a wise fashion, that kind of thing? Global security. How is it? And global security. Global security. Okay. Um, my opinion has always been we were there too long and that we had lost our mission and that our mission morphed into sort of nation building and frankly we don't have the money nor are we very good at nation building. Um, in the end, you're right, the Taliban has, there has been a resurgence of the Taliban. I think some of our money is actually going to the Taliban, which I'm not in favor of. Uh, I think the exit was very messy from a military point of view. Um, I'm not a military general or anything like that, but I can't imagine the last place you leave being a commercial airport versus Bagram Air Force Base, which is out in the countryside. No one should have ever been at that commercial airport in the end. They should have all retreated as they left and left from the military base, and I think we wouldn't have had that disaster. We probably wouldn't have lost the 13 soldiers. The question about being there and whether we should, in the very beginning, it was about 9-11, and the belief is still that the people who organized 9-11 were in Afghanistan. We voted to go after those people. There were some debate early on whether to be turned over, and then they weren't, and then there was a war. I think the war should have ended uh, you know, once uh, we had defeated and captured the people who, who attacked us on 9-11, the war morphed on and on. It was costing $50 billion a year. We spent, you know, over a trillion dollars there. And you can argue, well, it got worse when we left, or you can argue that maybe some of these problems have to, that maybe we don't have the ability to bring Western-style democracy to countries that haven't uh, gained it through an organic process from the ground up. Um, do I have sympathy, particularly for women in Afghanistan and what's happened? Um, you know, I remember, you know, writing about, uh, this wasn't Afghanistan, it was Pakistan, about Malala and the, you know, what, what, what happens with sort of the violence over there and the violence towards women and towards children. But it, it doesn't mean necessarily that the uh, that United States necessarily makes it better. And if we decide that that is the role we're going to do, that we're going to stay in countries forever until they become like us, uh, we have to just have a real debate about where the money comes from. Uh, the problem with the money is we're a trillion dollars short just paying for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and then military and everything else. We've got to figure out how to pay for things. But our history of nation building hadn't been that great. Um, it ends up being a lot of times we pick the leaders, and there were times during the war in Afghanistan when we actually sided with people who were drug dealers because they were pro-American. We would go in and side with a warlord in there, and we'd, you know, there were also times when local villages actually chose the Taliban. Why? Because the Tal Taliban had a really strict, uh, you know, law and order sort of thing. And I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying local people actually did choose the Taliban at some time over a drug dealer that we were in support of. Um, the longtime president, you know, some of his family were accused of being in the drug trade. So I, I think in the end, nation building is not something that I think is part of our constitutional foreign policy. I don't think we can afford it either. Let's go to the next question. Yeah. Uh, right here is good. Uh, my name is James Ben. I'm a student in Indiana University. First, uh, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, and my question was, so firstly, I really liked how you said that the more, the more power the government gets, the less that people have. So, like, throughout the last 200 years, the United States was strengthening, strengthening in its central power. And my question is, do you think uh, the government is going to become stronger over time, continue, and continue uh, growing, b getting bigger? Uh, if you look at, if you plotted sort of government growth on sort of a timeline, you're right, government's gotten bigger and more intrusive, has taken on more responsibilities. Part of the problem is, let's say there's a, a social problem out there. Like right now, people think there's a social problem with the Saudis owning the PGA or merging the PGA. It becomes a problem, they come here, and people think, I'm gonna do something about it. Very rarely does someone come to Washington, see a problem, say, why don't we undo some government program that might be causing the problem? We always add to it. That's why we have like 82 housing project legislation. We have 82 different programs doing the same thing. 
I actually have a bill called the duplication scoring bill that when you put forward a bill, you would have to do the research to see if someone's already done it before. But I guess there is the worry that there is a gradual tendency for government to grow. But what I would argue is as government gets bigger, your freedom gets smaller. And so we have to stand up to that. But there are overriding big uh, philosophical questions we have to answer. Do we believe there should be limits on what a democracy can do? Do we believe in constitutional restraints? Or do we believe that a living constitution means the majority just should get what they want? Realize though, and this is my warning to those who believe in a living constitution and think the constitution's old fashioned or racist or it shouldn't have it, that if you believe that and we have no restraints on it, the majority gets what they want, majorities can do awful things. One majority, may not have been a majority, but I think a plurality voted for Hitler at one time. There have been very bad people brought into power through majority vote. And the safety we have is if we get a president that is a terrible authoritarian, we have the checks and balances of Congress, the court system, and ultimately the president has limited powers. And those are good things. But if we don't believe in those limitations and we believe in unlimited power, um, it's sort of like the emergencies. And I'll give you an example. Presidents since the 1930s had the power to shut down the internet. Now, they didn't know it was an internet back then. They had the, it's the FCC emergency power that lets the president shut down all communications in our country. Does anybody, no matter where you are on the spectrum, think that with any president, Republican or Democrat, should have the power to close the internet? Now some will say, oh, we need it for safety and there might be a safety time, there might be some bad information, people are believing the wrong thing that the president shut down. That to me is not just uh, scary, that, that's sort of the definition of authoritarianism. I've been trying to stop that and get a vote on that and that's actually part of my free speech bill is to get rid of the internet, what they call the internet kill switch. But it's difficult. I'm having a difficult time getting bipartisan support for that. They were more for it when Trump was in power and they're less for it now that Biden's in power. I'm pretty equal opportunity. I don't care which party's in power. I want limitations in power on all forms of government. But your question about there being an inevitable trend, it's easy to look at it in that way. If you do, you'll give up. I don't want to give up because I guess the way I look at our country is so many great things have come from this country. People are dying to get into this country. It's got something that people from all over the world want to come here. We got to work to protect that and protect that engine of capitalism that creates this enormous wealth for this country. So I think it's worth fighting for whether the trend lines are for or against us. Hi. Thanks for being here. I was just gonna ask in your opinion, what is the best way to build coalitions across the aisle? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. And there have been some that have developed over time uh, on issues of war. I've worked with uh, Bernie Sanders. I've worked with uh, uh, Merkley and Markey as well. Um, on issues of civil liberties, uh, Wyden and I have several bills together. Um, even though Tim Kaine and I aren't in exactly the same place on an AUMF, he thinks that we should repeal the old one. He just wants to replace it. And I want to replace it with the Constitution with nothing and then you vote if you have to go to war. But there are coalitions that do build. The best way is this, and this is what I would suggest too, if you're going out with friends and one of you's a progressive and one of you's a conservative, you get along by not fighting about the stuff you know you disagree. If you go out and you wanna talk about abortion all night, you're gonna fight with each other and you won't be friends. But you can go out and say, you know, like I agree with many progressives, I'm, I'm against most war. I think war's a terrible thing and a last resort. We should almost never go to war. We should vote on it when we go to war. And we should really do it as a defensive action, not an offensive action. And I find common ground. But most of those people I mentioned I've worked with, I don't talk to them about taxes. I don't talk to them about gun control. I don't talk to them about uh, regulations, things that we disagree on. Um, and I can't say I'm perfect either. I get in arguments with people too, so I mean, but I would say that there is common ground. I think the common ground is easier if you think yourself a, more of a libertarian than a conservative, or more of something, a limited government person versus a Republican versus a Democrat. Um, because I would say that the, the traditionally Democrat position on war is closer to where I am. The issue of civil liberties, Democrats were better on. Now some of that's flipping now. I don't think the Democrats are as good on free speech, and I wanna get more of them involved. But I guess it's probably agreeing to disagree on some of the more contentious stuff and trying to find the common ground by talking about the things we agree with. And part of that's being politic, you know? 
if, if I'm here talking to you all, and I know half of you are against gun control, I'm not going to give you the whole speech on convincing you of, you know, for gun control or vice versa. So um, I think being selective and trying to find your areas of agreement is the best way. Uh, right next to us, Jim. Hello, Senator. Oh, sorry, that was a little loud. Um, hello, Senator Paul. Thank you for coming here. I just have uh, one question. So how do you think that the view of limited government could lead to the government failing to uphold its end of the social contract, whether that be, for example, I want to have that, I'm, I should have the right to be able to be healthy and live a healthy life, and that may require the government to have, um, uh, similar to like what Obamacare does, being in, involved in the healthcare space, or whether that might be my right to economic security and free labor and not where I might not be able to have that if there's an industry that's entirely controlled by a monopoly and the government might have to intervene to fix I, that. I think, that, I think that it's a good argument, but then there's a practical part of that debate. So for example, if we want to look at all forms of health care and look for who are the people that seem to be faring the worst, having the worst health outcomes in our country, there are people on government health care. And you can argue there's other reasons for that, but people on Medicaid have the worst health outcomes in our country. And a part of our, the argument against the argument I'm making would be, well, it's because of the way they eat, or it's because of their body weight, or lack of taking care of themselves, or can't afford medicines, or whatever. Most of the things in our country are already free. Most of what I'm talking about is not getting rid of Medicaid, it's telling someone that looks like you, you probably don't need to be on Medicaid. You're young, you appear to be able-bodied, you ought to work. And there are plenty of jobs out there. And so does that make me a mean person? I don't know. See, Obamacare expanded Medicaid to a lot of people I don't think need to be on Medicaid. Um, look, at, look at food stamps, for example. I'm going to bring up something on food stamps, and I am talking with a Democrat on this. If I get my amendment passed, I think I would save more lives than Obamacare, Medicaid, and everything all together. And you know what my amendment would be? No more unhealthy food for food stamps. The biggest problem in our country isn't starvation. It isn't lack of food. It's too much food, and too much of the wrong food. I can think of no reason why the government, or you, or me, or the taxpayers, should buy Coca-Cola or Pepsi for somebody. None. Now, does that mean I'm perfect and don't drink a Coke sometimes? I do it with my own money, you know? We shouldn't be, you know, the unhealthy nature of weight is, 80% of type 2 diabetes is weight, maybe 90%. Almost all of it's curable by weight loss. If you get somebody who's 100 pounds overweight and, you can, and, and get them to lose 100 pounds real easy, it's like almost 100% cure for diabetes. But what do you think my odds of passing an amendment? You know who the biggest opponent to my amendment is? The people who distribute Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> and I didn't realize that, but there's a lot distributed through food stamps. But chips, snack food, all that stuff shouldn't be, shouldn't be done by the government. So, but, uh, so I think there's an argument for what's most compassionate. Uh, you can argue it'd be compassionate that everybody has free health care and they don't, they don't have to do anything. But then, you know, Canada has that model, and for years and years and years, people in Michigan have set up businesses to get people to ferry them across into Michigan to get their heart surgery. There are people who do literally die waiting. So you can make something free, but I think you devalue something when you make it free. It's not really free anyway. You still pay for it, but it's through taxes. But when you disperse the cost of it, and there's no cost coming from you, you don't use it very wisely. So the same thing that Friedman said about no one spends somebody else's money as wisely as their own, it's the same way with spending your health care resources. If it costs you something, you'll be conscious of it, and you may want to conserve your dollars. That's why like health savings accounts, and if it's your money, and some employers actually do this, they give you $1,000, and they say that'll meet your deductible, but if you don't spend it on your health care, you know what? Many other people say, oh, do you need preventative care? Preventative care is exercising and eating well for the most part, and maybe getting your blood pressure checked and blood once a year. And for young people, it might not even be that hardly. It's really about preventative, the way you eat, the way you exercise. But I don't think it's compassionate necessarily to give everybody free health care. I think it's more compassionate to limit the free stuff to only those who need it. And part of that gets back to the economic argument. You only have so many people in the wagon, you gotta have people pulling the wagon. People pulling the wagon are those who are working. The vast majority need to be working. There are millions of jobs in America right now being unfulfilled. So my goal is not to expand Medicaid. My, my goal is to have less people on food stamps and less people on Medicaid. Not because I'm heartless, because I want them all to be working. And there are jobs out there. But we train people not to work. And we have this big fight over the debt ceiling. 
and the other party resisted tooth and nail work requirements, I wouldn't give away any welfare to anybody who didn't work but was able to work. That would exclude some people, and there would be, have to be some rules about young moms with young kids that can't, that can't work. But I would have work requirements for everybody. And not because I hate people or I'm mean, work is a redeeming value. You get your self-respect, you get your self-esteem through work. People who don't work don't get any self-esteem. It's not, it shouldn't be punishment, it should be something that we want. But um, let's do one or two more questions. Uh, let's, that, let, how about if uh, somebody was a, says you're a progressive, raise your hand and get a question. There, right here. I wanna, don't want to be accused of not taking a hard question. Of course. Don't make it too hard. Hi, uh, my name is Jacqueline Burr. I'm a student with the Fund for American Studies, and I'm studying history and journalism in Texas right now. Um, since you've said multiple times that you're a firm believer in limited government and making sure that the power of the federal government is uh, lower so people have more rights, how do you view government intervention in school curriculum, specifically in the context of legislation concerning critical race theory and other things about um, maybe legislation concerning when uh, history of the United States and things not, basically things that are not being taught when they should be. I think it's a good question, but my, I guess the first thing that I would dispute slightly is the way the question is set up. You said government intervention in schools for what aspects of curriculum that aren't sort of fundamental aspects. So if I have a private school, and you're the government, and you want to come in and tell me I can't have drag dancers in my school, I don't think the government should be involved at all. But if it's a government school, it's already our money. It's sort of like food stamps. Because I've had a, a young staffer for one of the Democrat congressmen said, well, what about the rights of the poor people to choose their food? And it's like, well, you have rights with your own money. You don't have any rights with somebody else's money. They're, those are attached to the, the public's interest. So the government schools that are state funded uh, will be regulated by the state legislature. The limitations to that, I think, are based on, on the voting habits of who gets elected. And they will be different. It's a, one of the good things, actually, of federalism. Some people hate it, but you know what? California is in, inviting every drag queen in the country to go to California. That's fine. In Tennessee, they don't, they don't really want that in their schools. They think maybe there are some other fundamental subjects that should be taught. So it will be different depending on the, on the states. But is it an infringement of somebody? No, if the government pays for your school, it's the obligation of the government to be involved, and they're going to be involved either way, if you have the purse strings. Now, I would agree with you if it's a private school, and the government comes to my private school, it's none of the business of the government what I teach or what I do in a private school, whether it's far out left or far out right or down the middle, religious, unreligious, you name it. So to me, it all depends on who, who, who owns it, whose money it is, and who, whose school it is. It, it's, a, it's a good debate like on the right to privacy. I said I believe in privacy, I absolutely do. But we had a bill on the floor yesterday on uh, trying to attach warning labels to refrigerators that are spying on people or whatever. And I stopped the bill from happening because I do believe in the right to privacy. If the government's in charge of the refrigerators and the government refrigerators are spying on us, I'll be the first one to say, I don't want that. And I'll pass a law to stop the government refrigerators from spying on us. But if it's Frigidaire or uh, General Electric, don't buy them if you don't like them. Same with Twitter. Everybody's got an opinion. A lot of conservatives want to shut down Twitter and all this. If you don't like them, don't use them. Free country. But I think there's a First Amendment problem to the government shutting them down. If 150 million young people are using them, expressing themselves on Twitter, they have a right. So to me, the defining nature of how I come to any debate of where I am on it is who owns it. If the government owns it, the voters and the taxpayers are going to have a right to pretty much they can go either way. I might not go that direction of, of the regulation, but there is a direction and the government's going to be involved. If it's private money, the government should mostly uh, leave people alone. Yes. Uh, hello, Senator Rampole. I just wanted to thank you for your time. I'm a, uh, Adrian Morales. I'm a rising senior at Texas Christian University, and I just wanted to ask you, uh, how do we maintain the Federal Reserve's nonpartisanship while limiting its influence as a government institution on the global financial sector? So. Um, I think they need more oversight, not less. Now, when you say it that way, it sounds, well, it sounds good, more oversight, not less. But then the other people will say, oh, no, we need more independence, not less, you know, less political involvement in the Fed. I also would argue that the same argument I would make for 
the federal government that the less it does, the less problems we have, the more we limit the sphere of influence of the federal government. That's to my liking, same with the Fed. The more we limit their sphere of influence. So for example, the number one most important price in the economy, not the price of shoes, not the price of food, it's the price of money. And so the price of money is a feedback mechanism. So as an economy heats up and they're building more and more houses and building more and more stuff and everybody's borrowing money, the demand for money goes up. When the demand for money goes up, the price of the money should go up. That's interest rates. But if the Federal Reserve intervenes and keeps the interest rates at 2%, you're not getting a signal that you've gone too far. So in 2007, when all these houses were being built and everything was being sold and all these junk mortgages were being resold, they didn't get the right signal. If you're building all these houses, interest rates shouldn't have been 2%. The market would have had them be 5 or 6 or 7. What happens? Then the economy slows down. The cyclical nature of the economy comes from interest rates. What does the Federal Reserve do? Fixes the interest rates. So they've done it for years and years, the 2%, and they mainly do it for this. The dishonesty perpetrated on the American people is we'll give you whatever you want. If you're on the right, I'll give you all the military industrial complex you want. If you're on the left, I'll give you all the welfare complex that you want, we'll spend money on everything, and we'll borrow it. We have 31 trillion in debt. How do we do that? We keep the interest rate at 2%. But then all of a sudden, we go even crazier during COVID and close the economy down. And this happened under Trump, and something I disagree with, the spending went through the roof. Now it was Republicans and Democrats, almost all of them were for it, and the debt went through the roof, but what did we get? We got inflation, then the Federal Reserve got, got, uh, became afraid. And probably interest rates did need to go up. But I don't think men or women sitting in a room should determine the price of anything. Ultimately, the Soviet Union failed and communism fails when you set the price of something. They would set the, I always argue that the Soviet Union was defeated not through military might, they were defeated because they couldn't determine the price of bread. If you set the price of bread too high, the bread sits on the shelves and there's a black market. If you set it too low, the bread's gone. How do you determine the moral price of bread? There is no moral price of bread. It's what supply and demand intersect to create a price, and it's efficiently done, and it's voluntary because millions of you bid every day on whether you want to buy bread. Should be the same for money. Even more important for money, because money's part of every transaction, not bread's only part of bread transactions. But the Federal Reserve fixes the interest rates, and now a group of men and women have agreed to ratchet it up, and it, will, it is causing a slowdown, it's causing some disruption, what happens if they didn't? I don't know. We get runaway inflation, so we're caught between a rock and a hard place. But I do think that if I had my druthers, I'd audit the Fed, and there was some bipartisan consensus on that. Bernie Sanders, I think, was the only Democrat that supported it. It was mostly Republicans. But I would audit the Fed, and if I had my druthers, if we weren't able to end the Fed, I would try to end its prerogative to change the interest, to suppress the interest rates, and try to let interest rates on a daily basis be more reflective of supply and demand. All right, let's, uh, let, let, I'll do one more question, then, then I gotta go. All right, over here. Have they started the vote? Are they waiting for me? Oh. All right, I'll make this quick. Thank you, Senator Paul. Um, I'm a Kentuckian, so I'm very happy to be asking this yeah. question. Um, uh, you talked earlier about the Supreme Court not necessarily getting things right all the time, um, especially with Plessy versus Ferguson Am and I things like that. Go back, start again. Am I comfortable with what? Start the question again. Okay, okay, go ahead. Um, my question mainly pertains to the Supreme Court. As um, you stated earlier, sometimes the Supreme Court can be wrong. I was just wondering if you thought that any of the recent rulings, whether it be on affirmative action, uh, LGBTQ plus rights or student debt relief were um, wrong or should have been decided differently? Well, those are, those are, <laughs> that's a short question, but a lot in the question. Um, as far as, um, let's, I guess, look at the, at the affirmative action ruling. I think that uh, government shouldn't uh, discriminate based on race. And people say, well, it wasn't, you know, but you still have to explain it is discrimination against the people who were denied admission. You know, the, there was a specific uh, individual, you know, an Asian was denied admission because of the affirmative action. Um, I think that um, it is a healthier world when it's just a meritocracy. Um, am I against things like diversity? No, I'm all for it. In fact, I think there's a great deal of it done privately 
uh, both at the college level, but also really even more importantly in the workplace. Um, and this is one of the reasons I disagree with people saying it's a terrible place. And I don't mean to just single out one race, but if you are an African-American man or woman and you have a college degree and you are a hard worker, the world wants you and I promise you, you will succeed. Every major corporation in America wants you. It's not a hateful world. It's a world where go out and bust your butt because it's a good place. So I don't really think we need some sort of special rules to sort of define that. And uh, so I, th I think the court, did they have a role in it? They had to. I mean, it was uh, the court's already been involved in, in this. So uh, I think uh, it was right, rightly decided. We'll end there. Thank you, guys.